little slowly this morning, um, <clears throat> as to be expected with our snowfall yet again. I think all of us are moving a little sluggishly this week. But first, I'd like to welcome everybody to the February session of Clinical Research Professional Training Series. Uh, this morning, we have speaking for us Kristen Heitman. Uh, she is currently uh, works in our um, the OSU Clinical Research Center and has some important information about including nutrition in clinical research. So Kristen, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, get started, we welcome you. All right. Thank you, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just like Karen said, I'm going to be talking about nutrition research today. Um, I'll do a brief introduction. So I am the registered dietitian at the Clinical Research Center, um, and I also support roles at the CCTS and CTMO. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in dietetics and my master's in human nutrition, and I'm currently working on my PhD, but that is outside the realm of clinical research. Um, so that's just a little bit about my background. Today, we're going to be talking about three main topics. So first, um, I'll introduce nutrition, its importance in clinical trials, and the NIH st strategic plan. I'll talk about some clinical research center resources that we offer and how we can support you. Um, and then I'll touch on food insecurity. Um, when discussing what would uh, be helpful for everyone in this, in this um, training today, Karen suggested food insecurity might provide some good resources for families and research participants. Um, and so there, there will just be a little bit information at the end on that. So why is nutrition important? Um, working in clinical trials, I'm sure you are all aware um, of the, our healthcare system, and you probably know a little bit about nutrition, um, but it is a preventable cause of death. And it's one of the biggest prevent preventable causes of death worldwide. Um, there are a lot of diseases linked to nutrition, um, and a few of those are in the top leading causes of death in the United States. So that includes heart disease, cancers, strokes, and diabetes, alcohol, um, is nutrition related. So that could be argued for accidents as well. Um, but nutrition is, it's a huge part, um, of our health and, of us as individuals. I mean, I'm sure all of us in the past 24 hours have put something into our bodies. And so it's it's um, something we don't think about a lot when we are making decisions and choices about the foods we eat um, and the beverages we drink, but all of those can, Im can impact our health. And more on a global scale, the risk that poor diets pose to mortality and morbidity is now greater than the combined risks of unsafe sex, alcohol, drug, and tobacco use. So the impact is great both in the US and worldwide. A little bit about the background of nutrition and the National Institutes of Health. So nutrition has been a part of various NIH work groups for a long time, but it's never had its own house, I, I'll call it. Um, it's never had a designated area within the NIH. And it's, it's partially because it innervates so many different areas. It, it wouldn't make sense to have an isolated nutrition institute when it's part of every other institute at the NIH. Um, so it's not an isolated area of research at all. It's very interdisciplinary. So nutrition can include data scientists, bioinformatics experts, geneticists, nutrition researchers, um, both bench science all the way through clinical um, trials and clinical care. 
behavioral scientists, uh, medical doctors, biomedical experts, and that's just to name a few. So there is a great need for training the nutrition scientific workforce um, and really just educating people on this need as well. So in fiscal year 2019, these are some of the biggest spenders of um, research dollars that were related to nutrition. Um, so ones that are more familiar with me would be the National Cancer Institute, um, National Institute for Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Um, and I would say those are the two biggest ones that I hear about as a research dietitian. Um, but there are a few other really great spenders. Um, when nutrition, when the Office of Nutrition Research first established um, itself within the NIDDK, and you can see that that was the, um, the biggest spender here in green. So the nutrition at the NIH was originally housed um, within NIDDK, and that's kind of where it had its origins, where they pushed a lot for um, nutrition to be more at the forefront of science and clinical trials. Um, but since then, it has moved to the office of the director over here. And the office of the director um, somewhat oversees all the rest of the 27 institutes of the NIH. So from a um, organizational perspective, they it's, it's at a higher level now, um, which allows for it to be innervated to all of these other areas. So in May of 2020, the first strategic plan for nutrition research was released by the NIH. So again, this uh, this is the first time they've had a strategic plan for nutrition. It is um, new to me. It's new to uh, a lot of both bench scientists and clinical clinicians, clinical researchers as well. Um, and so what we're trying to do here at OSU is really just educate people on this plan, tell them it's there and um, start the conversation about how we can get it integrated into our trials. So the, the goal of this whole plan um, and initiative is to save lives, reduce disease burden, and reduce spending for healthcare because our healthcare costs in the United States are very high. Um, and this strategic plan ideally will really guide science over the next 10 years. So it gives, it gives somewhat of a snapshot of where we think we're going. And in 2030, we can look back and say, did we get, did we reach those goals? Did we get there? Where, um, you know, where did the science take us? What did we learn? Um, so this is really where we think we're going, where we want to go over the next 10 years. And again, the Office of Nutrition Research was established within NIDDK in 2015. So about five years ago, it was established. Their first strategic plan came out this year. So this is all a very new area for um, NIH research. As a dietitian, I get asked a lot, what should I eat? Or what's the best diet? Or Sometimes I don't even tell people I'm a dietitian because I'm sick of hearing that question. Um, and no perfect diet exists. So people are different and so are their nutrient needs. And that is the overarching theme of this strategic plan. It's really to find individualized, actionable dietary recommendations for people. Um, and we call that precision nutrition. So precision nutrition is similar to precision medicine, it's using a lot of information such as demographics, dietary habits, the microbiome, genetics, other omics, physical activity, health status, metabolism, the food environment, socioeconomics, psychosocial factors, environmental exposures, the life cycle, food environment, I think socioeconomics is on there twice, um, but it's using all of those things 
to inform what a person should eat. Um, so our current dietary recommendations are created with the idea in mind that they are recommendations for the healthy population. And we know that most of the population isn't healthy. Most of the population has a chronic disease of some sort um, or other acute diseases. And so having one blanketed recommendation for all healthy people or all people um, hasn't been the best approach for us nutrition wise. So the, the answer to what should I eat is, is much more complex than we give it credit for. So there is a study that I thought was a really good example of precision nutrition and utilizing this, this idea of precision, precision nutrition, um, in the clinical trial realm. So this study was done in Israel and it was published in cell, uh, in 2015. And it was a trial of 800 healthy adults ages 18 to 70. And it looked at glucose response after eating the same food. So participants were given uh, standardized meals and then their glucose response was tested afterwards. And what was found is that, that their glucose response was highly variable. And um, they took that information. Um, so these are all the different types of information that was collected at the beginning of the study. So food diaries, anthropometrics, questionnaires, blood tests, and microbiome. And they utilize that information um, with machine learning and algorithms to predict um, p individuals' glucose response. So they created these predictive equations that helped to um, say, okay, this healthy person might have a response like this, but because this different person has a different microbiome and different anthropometrics, their response might be something else. So the strongest models were based um, on or linked to the microbiome data, uh, which is really interesting and very complex, definitely a newer area of research. But this study really showed that personalized dietary interventions lowered post-meal glycemic response. Um, so that's just to say one recommendation for all people is not maybe not the best um, recommendation. And this um, study actually had a video abstract, which I thought was really cool. So I'm going to play that here. And if you have trouble hearing it, just put something in the chat and I'll see what I can do about that. When we eat, the carbohydrates from the food are broken down to simple sugars, which are then absorbed from our intestine into the bloodstream. Blood sugar levels are a key factor that affects the pathogenesis of diseases such as diabetes and obesity. Diets aimed at controlling blood glucose levels are often similar, even for different people. What if we told you that these very common diets aimed at maintaining stable blood sugar levels may in some people achieve the exact opposite? How is this possible? People are different in many ways. For example, in their genetic makeup, in their lifestyle, and also in their microbiomes. The microbiome is a huge ecosystem of trillions of bacteria living inside our body with more than 100 times the number of genes contained in the human genome. The microbiome is influenced by what we eat and in turn affects our response to food. And as the microbiome differs greatly from one person to another, it can also affect the blood sugar response to food. For the past few years, scientists at the Weizmann Institute 
have studied the factors underlying variations in post-meal blood sugar responses. They collected health and lifestyle data from 800 volunteers who were connected to a device that monitored their blood sugar level every five minutes for an entire week. The participants also used a mobile document what and when they ate, exercised, slept, and so on. <laughs> Stool samples were collected in order to analyze the composition and activity of their microbiomes. The scientists discovered that when different people ate identical foods, they often reacted in a very different way. For example, the blood sugar level of some people rose more significantly after eating sushi than after eating ice cream. Scientists were able to integrate all of the data they collected into an algorithm that successfully predicted the blood sugar response to the meals of the 800 participants. The same algorithm achieved similar accuracy when predicting the sugar responses of 100 new participants. The scientists also showed how the algorithm could be used to prescribe personalized diets a good diet that lowers post-meal sugars, and a bad diet that raises sugar responses. Interestingly, some foods that appeared on the good diet of one person appeared on the bad diet of another. <laughs> Let's hear what the researchers themselves have to say. If I highlight the key contributions of... Okay, so it looks like <laughs> the audio was a little bit behind the video. We'll see. I'll, I'll try to restart it one more time to see if it goes. But if it gets off again, um, I'll just continue. Of our work, I would say that uh, the first is in highlighting the need for personalized nutrition, which we demonstrate by showing that the blood sugar response of different people to identical meals can be hugely different. And as soon as we saw this data, we realized that general dietary recommendations given to the entire population may have limited uh, efficacy. Uh, the second is in then measuring for every individual in our nearly 1,000 people cohort, a very comprehensive profile that includes their medical background, questionnaires, physical activity, blood tests, and gut microbiome function and composition. And then integrating this data into a computational algorithm that could successfully predict the personalized blood glucose response of people to arbitrary meals. And then finally, in showing that applying this algorithm to design personally tailored dietary interventions in individuals could significantly lower their blood sugar response to food, and uh, that was accompanied by consistent alterations to the gut microbiome. We know that nutrition is a very important risk factor for human metabolic disease and especially to the obesity and diabetes epidemics that are affecting the lives of close to half of the world's population. In this work, we link nutrition in a personalized manner to human risk to develop elevated blood sugar levels and their many complications. As scientists, we often deal with very basic uh, questions, but in this work, we are very happy to also introduce a potential that if further developed would allow to benefit the health of millions across the world. This research marks an important step towards personalized nutrition by predicting post-meal blood glucose glycemic responses. The scientists hope that this approach will help to achieve a healthier lifestyle and prevent metabolic disease worldwide. Okay, so that um, that whole study is one example of precision nutrition at work. And um, that is the type of study that the NIH is really getting at and wanting to dig into with this new strategic plan. So precision nutrition is the overarching theme for the plan. And the plan has four strategic goals. The first one is to spur discovery innovation through foundational research. The second is investigate the role of dietary patterns and behaviors for optimal health. The third, to define the role of nutrition across the lifespan for healthy development and aging. And the fourth, reduce the burden of disease in clinical settings. 
And then there's cross-cutting research areas across those, which include minority health and health disparities, specifically the health of women, rigor and reproducibility. That is a big one when it comes to nutrition research because there can be so much variability um, in the way that data is collected. Um, also data science, system science and artificial intelligence, and lastly, training the scientific workforce. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into each of these strategic goals. Um, so the first goal, spur discovery and innovation through foundational research aims to answer the question, what do we eat and how does it affect us? So we really wanna assess gaps in nutrition related genes and pathways. Um, so that could include this uh, artistic photo over here of solute carrier transports. Um, so those are membrane, membrane proteins that traffic nutrient and drugs across borders. Um, so understanding those, identifying those um, can really help us progress forward in this scientific endeavor. Improve the understanding of sensory nutrition and ingestive behaviors. So when we say sensory nutrition, we're talking about things like how does a food smell affect us and the taste? How does the taste affect us? And um, why do different people respond differently to different tastes? Um, investigate diet host microbiome relationships, identify metabolites. This is some work that I know researchers at OSU are actively pursuing. So this is really exciting. Um, develop new tools for measuring biomarkers. So metabolites could be one of those tools. And this is so important, um, again, because the way we collect nutrition data or the most common way to collect nutrition data is to ask people what they ate. And there's a lot of bias in that, or there can be, um, especially if it's a study like a weight loss study, for example, people tend to underreport even more on weight loss studies than they do on other studies, which um, even on regular, like healthy population studies, um, a lot of people don't pay attention to what they put into their bodies and they forget. Um, so collecting dietary data is difficult, but if we were able to have a biomarker to measure that, or even a biomarker to calibrate uh, our diet records, um, that would be a way for us to get even closer to understanding what people are actually eating and develop user-friendly tools for collecting dietary data. Currently collecting dietary data is not <laughs> easy in any, by any means. Um, a lot of times I'm asking participants to write down everything they ate in the day while they're eating it um, because else they forget. And so it can, be, it can be tedious and it can be cumbersome to participants, especially if we're asking them to do it for seven days. Um, with a lot of detail. I always explain, I need, I need to know the type of butter. I need to know if the butter was salted. I need to know what the butter was on, how much the foods, um, how much butter the foods were cooked in, all of those tiny, tiny details. And a few other things in strategic goal one, develop new, new tools for measuring biomarkers. Okay, I think I already went through this. Um, but so for example, um, using artificial intelligence, this would be one example to be able to analyze what's in our food. Um, there, so this is uh, using a smartphone, for example, but they're, they're also testing things like wearable devices. So like a device that would go in on your tooth, attached to your tooth, kind of like a retainer um, that could identify what you're eating and how much you're eating. So using new technologies to better understand what we're putting in our bodies. Strategic goal two aims to answer the question, what and when should we eat? So the when really incorporates things like circadian rhythms and fasting, which is a very hot topic in um, the media these days. I get a lot of questions about fasting, but there's really not a lot of scientific evidence that on intermittent fasting at all. 
Um, so we don't have the information to be able to say when should you eat versus when you shouldn't eat. Um, so trials that really look at these um, determinants are needed. Uh, so advanced methods for dietary pattern analysis. And a dietary pattern is kind of like a bird's eye view of your diet. So um, it's interesting the way nutrition science has progressed over the years. We used to think in terms of nutrients, like, oh, are you getting enough vitamin D or are you getting enough calcium? Um, but we don't eat nutrients, we eat food. Um, so then it, it zoomed out a little bit and said, okay, what foods are you eating and what nutrients are in those foods? And now it's even a broader level saying, what is your dietary pattern? So on average during the week, during the month, during the year, what does your diet look like? Because that's really determining your health. It's not if you eat, you know, broccoli, one cup of broccoli every day, that doesn't, um, that, that doesn't determine if you are, if that is aiding your health or being a detriment to your health, um, because it's only a tiny piece of the whole dietary pattern. Determine mechanisms of inter-individual variability in response to dietary patterns. So that um, research that we just looked at, that would really be, um, that would really fit this, um, this goal. Uh, determine health benefits and mechanisms of time-based dietary patterns. Again, things like when to eat, your circadian rhythm, sleep and wake cycle, fasting, discover and validate prognostic chronic disease biomarkers, develop algorithms to predict what we should eat. Again, pointing to that study, leverage behavioral and implementation science to change eating behavior. Changing eating behavior is no easy feat either. And that is, that in itself should be a, its own strategic goal because we can know what to eat, but changing our behavior is a whole nother, a whole nother game. Um, and if you're motivated to be healthy and you care about your health, um, it's a little bit easier, but if you don't, it is very, very challenging. Strategic goal three, define the role of nutrition across the lifespan, really looks at the developmental origins of health and disease. So um, we are learning that later in life, health outcomes can be linked to what your mom was eating when she was pregnant with you. Um, so really looking at the very, very beginnings of the life cycle and nutrition for mom and baby and how that determines health later in life is really what this goal is getting at. And it answers the question, how does what we eat promote health across our lifespan? So looking at the role of prenatal nutrition, knowledge of human milk consumption, influence of diet and nutritional status on infant health outcomes, development of predictive epigenetic tools and the role of nutrition in older adults to promote healthy aging. And strategic goal four, reduce the burden of disease in clinical settings. So how can we improve the use of food as medicine is the question that this goal aims to answer. So looking at drug disease nutrient interactions, assessment of energy, protein and micronutrient malnutrition, and identify clinical areas for ceasing MNT interventions. Um, MNT is medical nutrition therapy. So that would be things like um, tube feed and TPN, total parenteral nutrition, when really determining when we should start those in the hospital and when we should stop them. And so from this NIH strategic plan, there um, are a couple RFAs available. These were recently released, so I haven't gotten a chance to look deep into them yet. Um, but part of this initiative with the strategic plan is they are running a study called All of Us Research Program or the All of Us Study based on these four goals. So it's going to be a multi-site trial um, and applications are open to be 
a part of different different parts of that trial. So transitioning now into the Clinical Research Center and how this all of this information really matters for you. So nutrition is something to consider when um, running clinical trials because it can affect us in so many different ways. And so at the Clinical Research Center, we offer resources for you to help you with that. Um, so our services include nursing, we have a nursing staff, a lab, both a processing lab and an analytical and development lab, uh, nutrition, so that's my area, and we do some study coordination as well. So we are really a service center for researchers to help them carry out their research. So if you, for example, have a new trial that needs, um, nutrition counseling and you don't want to hire a dietitian onto your research team, you could just use our services and say, I need an hour counseling session for each participant. Um, and we can do that for you. So we are here to help implement research across the university. And we are physically located on the second floor of Dodd Davis, which is part of the medical center. Um, so we do have that our whole unit is dedicated to clinical trials. So there's no patients on that floor, only research participants. Research nutrition includes a lot of different things. And I love working in this area because I feel like I get to practice every, every different facet of dietetics. So we look a lot at diets. So whether that's education, analyzing the diet, assessing the diet, modifying the diet, creating controlled meals or research foods in our metabolic kitchen, uh, body composition assessment. So it can be easy, like height and weight, all the way to determining bone mineral density with our DEXA machine or lean body mass, fat mass, different um, anthropometrics like waist and hip measures. You wouldn't believe how many different kinds of waist measures there are. <laughs> um, but again, that gets at, you know, the need for rigor and reproducibility in our methods. Um, and so I actually help I can help also in the planning of studies by recommending, you know, one method over the other based on, based on the evidence and based on what um, is being done at the national level. So I also help investigators with methods development and scientific writing. Um, so those are two different ends of the spectrum, uh, but also data collection. Um, energy expenditure is another thing we do. So um, running indirect calorimetry tests, whether that's resting metabolic rate or substrate level oxidation, um, or using predictive equations to say, this is about how many calories your body burns in a day. So we can predict that or we can actually measure it. In terms of dietary assessment, there are three tools that, these are the three main tools that people use currently. So a 24 hour recall, that would be um, where I would call a participant or meet with them and talk to them um, and say, think back to the last 24 hours. So think back to when you woke up yesterday. What was the first thing you ate after you woke up? Um, and there's, there's different ways to do this. You can do an unannounced recall, um, which reduces the chance that people will change their diets for that because they don't know when the recall is going to be. Or you can do a scheduled recall um, in which they may take notes about what they ate um, and then be able to recall it easier. So there's pros and cons to both. Diet records, um, it's just writing down what you eat every day. And then FFQ is a food frequency questionnaire, which is um, a questionnaire that gets an overall picture of what you eat. It's not, um, it has different uses than the diet record in 24 hour recall because it's, it's something that you would use more on a population level than on an individual level. And so when you're picking a type of dietary assessment, some things to consider are the population and their literacy. Um, also their cultural background, because something like an FFQ might not be appropriate for them. 
uh, typical foods, valid validity of the tool, reproducibility of the data, dietary restrictions that people might have. Um, it wouldn't make sense to give someone an FFQ if they're fed on tube feed. Measurement error, recall bias, reactivity bias, study design, primary outcomes of the research. Um, people's attention span. <laughs> we have a, we have a study on our unit right now that we administer an FFQ, and the longest recorded time it has taken us to administer this FFQ should take twenty to thirty minutes, but <laughs> it never does with this specific study because of the population. The longest it has taken is three hours, so that's the record. Um, people's attention span is important to consider, and availability of the tool you're using. So when, when investigators come to me and give me a protocol and they've picked one of these three assessment methods at random and ask me to implement them, sometimes I think, how did you pick this? Um, because there's so many things that you should consider in the study design before you pick an assessment method. So if anyone is planning research, it's best to come to us beforehand um, rather than amidst the data collection. Uh, food and nutrient analysis. So at the CRC, we host different programs that help us to analyze at um, oh, the research level, different foods. Um, so NDSR nutrition system data, nutrition data system for research is um, a tool that I use almost every day. Um, it is the highest caliber nutrient analysis software. It's run by the University of Minnesota. And um, it is everything in it is evidence based. It's not like my fitness pail where you say, oh, this food isn't in it, I can add it myself. In NDSR, you cannot add anything yourself. Everything is based on uh, chemical analysis of the actual food. So you know that the data points are accurate. So when we're talking about reproducibility, using NDSR is reproducible at all different institutions. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of research uses NDSR for analysis. So that is one really good thing. Um, Pronutra is a similar program, though it's focused more so on the food service aspect. So we can, in that program, create a controlled meal. So we know every person on the study is getting the exact same food. And so every ingredient is weighed out to the 10th of the gram when we prepare it, we give it to the participant. And if they don't eat it all, we take it back, weigh every part of the food that they didn't eat, put that information back in Pronutra and Pronutra can calculate it, the exact amount of each nutrient, each food that the participant ate. So it's a very useful system for feeding trials. Um, and then dietary indices. So there are um, different types of index calculations that we use to give to really take the data that our program spit out and make it meaningful for a research study. So we can use the NDSR data to calculate what's called the healthy eating index. Um, and that can tell us how closely each person is to dietary recommendations. So it's a scale from zero to a hundred and it can say, yep, you are 100%, you're meeting all the dietary recommendations. Um, I will tell you, the average of people in the United States is around 50. Mine, it was in the 80s, so I've never met anyone who's gotten 100. <laughs> um, and I've mentioned our metabolic kitchen. So we have a kitchen on our unit where we create research foods, we create controlled meals, and we run feeding trials. So bringing it back to that study at the beginning, we talked about personalized nutrition by prediction of glycemic response. Um, if, for example, you were tasked with running this study, most of it could be done on our unit with the exception of the microbiome. So we don't do stool samples um, 
as of yet, that could be changing. Um, but our unit, we run blood tests, we give out questionnaires, we measure anthropometrics, we create um, the standardized meals that we give to participants. Um, so all, all of this we do and um, really helping to manage the study and whether that's the data, the participants. Um, this would be a, an example of a study that we could definitely help you run if um, you were ever tasked with it. And lastly, touching on food insecurity. Um, so food insecurity is influenced by a lot of different things, but mainly mental, physical illness, alcohol abuse, lack of awareness and access to assistance programs. Um, one in four Americans receives some sort of food assistance and the poverty obesity paradox makes food insecurity a little bit hard to believe for some people. And that paradox really says that you can be obese and you can be overweight and you can still be malnourished because food security is having enough food, but also the right type of food to promote your health. Um, so in the poverty obesity paradox, you might have enough food, but not the right types of food. The USDA has, um, done a lot of research in this area, um, and defined different levels of food security. So high food security would be no reported indications of food access problems or limitations. Marginal food security, what might be one or two indications um, per month. And then food insecurity, low food, they call it low food security, which is classified as food insecurity, um, would include reports of reduced quality, variety, or desirability of diet. So again, it gets at the amount of food and the type of food and then little or no indication of reduced food intake for that one. And then very low food security would be a decrease in intake and um, the decrease in quality or variety of food. So you can see um, this is data from 2017 to 2019, um, different food security status nationwide. Um, the most important thing to know is that Again, this affects one in four people. Um, and so if it comes up with a participant, there are things that you can do about it. So there are research tools to assess this in research if that's something you're looking for. We have a current study that's using the food insecurity questionnaires um, by the USDA. They have them for households, adults, youth. They have them in Spanish and Chinese. Um, and the important thing to remember with this is status is fluid. So just because someone is food insecure in August doesn't mean they were food secure in March. And especially this year, it's really interesting to look at the data. We're doing a study of food access in rural, rural areas of Ohio right now where we are giving out this questionnaire every three months. Um, so four times throughout the year and looking at really how the pandemic has affected that. Um, and then there are outside of the research realm, there are also a lot of resources for people, participants or the general population. If you know somebody um, who needs food assistance, there's um, a lot of different programs, which I've listed here that can help with that. Um, so if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. And just a plug, if you have a study that you think should have a nutrition component or does have a nutrition component, please ask us before you start collecting data because it's hard to change at that time. Um, but we, all, all of the employees at the CRC are eager to help you um, running clinical trials, um, even if it's just a quick question, um, definitely reach out. And if you have a non-nutrition related question, you can still email me and I will get you to the right person. So any questions, feel free to ask or pop them in the chat.
Thank you, Kristen. That was very interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing some more of these studies. Um, having been one that was always vertically challenged, weight has always been a challenge for me. Um, and eating the diets that are recommended haven't always worked for me either. So um, I do think that in this age of research, we are finding that one size does not fit all in, in most cases. Um, so it, that was very interesting. Again, if you have specific questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and we do have one question. Um, is there anything you could say about food insecurity on campus for students? So I know there are resources. <laughs> I am not as familiar with those resources because I did not go to Ohio State. Uh, well, I guess I do go there now. But um, in my undergrad, I was more aware of the resources. So for example, at Michigan State, we had our own food bank where students could go and get food. Um, so I know there are resources available. If you email me, I will get you in contact with those resources and people who know about them. So do we have any other questions? Are you, um, we will also um, also post that the slide that Kristen had of all of the RFAs that are um, currently out there um, so that we can make sure I'll, I'll have it posted on the CCTS board as well. Um, so that we can get that information out if anyone is thinking about maybe uh, looking at one of those for a studies, grants, et cetera. Um, as for that, again, um, feel free to reach out to Kristen with any questions. Um, you can also reach out to me. Uh, we are going to be starting into a series concerning diversity, equity, and um, inclusion um, for the next three months.